Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. Uh, I'm delighted to have Brian McVeigh back. And today we are gonna to be talking about metaphors. So Brian, take it away. Okay, so uh, thank you for having me back and uh, thank you everyone for uh, joining us today. So metaphors, I think uh, I became interested in metaphors many, many years ago, actually before I, I became uh, a student in college because I noticed that we use metaphors all the time for so many things. And it's almost impossible to talk about any subject without relying on some sort of metaphoric expression. So to begin, what I'll, in, well, let me just mention this now. I'm gonna be looking at metaphors from many different angles in order to stress how they play such a vital role in our lives. And one particular angle I'm gonna be looking at them from, of course, concerns uh, how Julian James made the argument that metaphors are the basis of consciousness, a conscious interiority, and that we actually cannot be conscious unless we have certain metaphoric uh, expressions, cer certain words that consciousness is built upon. But in any case, let me uh, start with a, a couple simple definitions of metaphors to designate a particular aspect of a thing or to describe something for which words are not available. Another uh, definition, our capability to step back from the natural and social environment and search out its familiar features and employ these features to explain the unfamiliar and generate as if knowledge or as if uh, as if meaning here something hypothetical. And really that's what the mind is all about. It's about coming up with new ways to deal with reality, which is always changing, of course. And reality uh, is always changing from a historical perspective. So that brings us to the question of why do metaphors emerge in the first place? Well, to put it simply, I think if you look at the history of humankind, we have technological changes that lead to economic changes, which lead to social changes, and then new psychological experiences. And these new psychological experiences have to be verbalized in novel creative ways. Languages, I think, do best what societies demand of them. That's basically what, what, what a language is. A, a, a language is not really a reflection of what's going on socially. It's more of an adaptation of what's happening in a particular society. Uh, and something else about language that Julian James emphasized, language is perception. And if you understand uh, the words that we use to grapple with reality, uh, basically it comes down to uh, how we perceive things. Uh, so something about metaphors I, I want to stress right now, um, despite the fact that there's been a tremendous amount of research on uh, metaphors, mostly in the humanities and the uh, uh, literary arts, nevertheless, there's this idea among some of us, especially some more hard-nosed social scientists, that metaphors are basically a type of linguistic ornament, something we use to make things sound more pretty that they're just clever tricks of the mind. But what I wanna emphasize is that metaphors are actually a fundamental process of the mind. They're a fundamental process of mentation. They're not just decorative uh, ornaments. And so just a few more uh, definitional, uh, definitional points about uh, metaphors to get the discussion rolling. And I'm gonna, this is actually uh, uh, taken out of a, a book that someone wrote about metaphors. Metaphors are ubiquitous, they're everywhere. They are woven into our social cultural environments and daily experiences. We cannot escape from them. We cannot in fact have a thought without to some degree relying on metaphors. Metaphors are basic cognitive mechanisms. They're not mere decorative frill, as I said before. They're, uh, Metaphors matter since they have real implications for judgment, political attitudes, for example, compliance with health recommendations, 
quality of our relationships. In fact, uh, metaphors basically determine the way we view the world. Um, and now let me shift gears uh, a little bit and talk about what I call two types of metaphors. And this, hopefully later on in the discussion, this distinction I'm making now will become more obvious. But we can talk about what I call figurative metaphors or literal metaphors. So a figurative metaphor describes how an individual interprets some sort of experience as, as a figure of speech. It's the stuff of poetry, song, playful talk. So I think we're familiar with that type of metaphor, figurative metaphors. But the other type of metaf metaphor, it sounds a bit odd, the expression, literal metaphors. This basically describes how individuals interpret an experience as being actually true based on some idea. So for example, think of the heart. When we say, uh, my heart is broken, of course, we literally know that our heart, my heart is not broken. But it seems in ancient times, uh, people actually did believe that. Uh, another common example, when we talk about something happening in my head. Well, thoughts do not occur in your head, right? It's impossible uh, because a thought is a, is a non-spatial entity. Now, of course, there are neurological, experience, neurological processes that I, I suppose physically are in the head, but that's not the same thing as thinking. And yet many neuroscientists follow this line of reasoning, this, this sort of reductionism, looking for psychological activity in the head, when in fact we know that psychological processes lack space. So there are, I'm bringing this up to make the point that in the sciences, there are many what I call literal foundational metaphors, where entire disciplines have been built on what are mistaken metaphors. Uh, so, um, uh, let's see if I can come up with some uh, other examples. Well, so, so in psychology, the, the mind as computer. Well, it's one thing to say the mind is like a computer. It's a very different thing to say the mind is a computer. And over the years, I think, especially when cognitive science came on the scene back in the 1960s, there was this idea that, well, now we have the answers to understanding how the mind works. The mind is basically just a, a, a wet computer. And if we can understand how computers work, we can understand how minds work. Well, that has led to a tremendous amount of research. Some of it useful. Metaphors sometimes do shed a, a certain truthfulness, I suppose, in our experiences. But sometimes metaphors lead us down the wrong path. And I think this idea that the mind is a computer is uh, not a very uh, uh, helpful uh, path uh, to take for, for different reasons we could uh, get into later. Uh, speaking of the mind, um, I've often tried to uh, think of uh, some so, uh, ways to describe what the mind is. And it seems to me that in mainstream establishment psychology, there's this idea that the mind is a container. It's based on this notion of the head, I guess, that people identify the head, or the, the brain with the mind. And again, we can talk about this later, but I do not think that the brain and the mind are the same thing. Um, and so there's this idea among many researchers that the mind is a type of vase. Uh, and the idea is that society deposits cultural contents into this container. Or in other words, society pours information into our heads. Where actually, um, I don't think that's, that's what's going on. I think there are better metaphors that we can uh, come up with. Uh, th this idea that the mind is a container, it, it presents the, the mind as something universal, that all people everywhere, all places, all periods have basically had the same mind and that the, the shape, the container of the mind is unchanging through time, doesn't change through history. And that socialization, enculturation, environmental influences, these are secondary 
what's important is to figure out what the shape of the vase is. And so there's this idea of what anthropologists uh, call psychic unity or uh, psychic structures that basically all peoples everywhere, everywhere have uh, the same container. Well, that's one way to look at things, but I prefer to look at the mind as what I call putty or silly putty, the sort of clay that kids would play with. And the idea is that, of course, all people have the same mental putty. However, this mental putty can be shaped into very different forms depending on the historical, social, cultural circumstances. And the shape can vary through time. It changes through time. And that socialization, incultural, enculturation, environmental influences, these are not secondary. These are primary to understanding the nature of the mind. So we're talking about not psychic unity, we're talking about psychic plasticity. We're not talking about psychic structures, we're talking about psychic diversity. And for those of you who have, who have been attending uh, these talks, you'll know that this resonates deeply with, uh, with the psychology of Julian James, a, a sort of Jamesian perspective, this idea of neurocultural plast plasticity through time. So in any case, that's, I just throw that out there as an example, the, how, how foundational, fundamental metaphors determine entire research agendas. And, and this is why, of course, it's important to pay attention to metaphors. So to change uh, the topic a bit, now I'm going to uh, talk a bit about um, how Julian James made this connection between the development of what he called consciousness about 3,000 years ago, and how this can be explained by changes in technology, changes in economics that led to changes in language that allowed us to experience the world uh, in a very different way. Basically, what happens is that metaphors uh, expand our psychological toolkit. It offers us new uh, perspectives. So uh, let's see. Um, maybe. Uh, so um, I, I want to get. So uh, Brian, uh, okay. how about this? Um, let me, I have something very interesting for people. Sure. Uh, this is not strictly metaphors, but one of the ways in which the English language grows, almost all, all languages grow, but English in particular is through idioms. So they, so it's not only, you know, one of the points, the great points you made is that circumstances keep changing and you have to use your old knowledge in order to access the new knowledge. The other phenomena here is when, uh, give me just a second. Okay, I'm going to just paste something here. Uh, control, okay, um, give me a second. All right, the other phenomena here is when a new endeavor starts, people end up using that endeavor as a basis to expand the context. So I want to give a very large example of that. Uh, give me a second. I'm just posting something in the chat. Need to do it in two steps. So when railroads came, there is a whole bunch of new words that got added to the English language. You, you must have heard of, you know, you have, he has a one track mind. He's going off track. He's living on the wrong side of the tracks. This is a whistle top stop tour. He's just letting off steam. Uh, he's blowing smoke. Uh, he has a tunnel vision. I see a light at the end of the tunnel. Streamlined, uh, keep on track, bells and whistles. That's the ticket. We're chugging along. Uh, it's a train wreck. It's like a freight train. It's the end of the line. So these are all, things in existence that came into being through railroads. And those are being used to describe what is going on inside our minds or in a social context. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That, that's, a, uh, that, that's an excellent example. And so those expressions that you used, of course, before the 19th century did not exist. Exactly. And so that's an example of how technology 
time we borrow from technology, just like with the metaphor of computers in order to explain social, so social psychological relations or what's happening in our head. Um, and then of course the question becomes in some contexts they're very useful, right? But then in other context, they have limitations. They don't necessarily explain all the fa facets of uh, how the mind operates. Yeah, the, the other point that I got from it because I have this dictionary of idioms and they are all, the idioms are dated. People regard language as almost fixed. Mm. Language changes a lot. And uh, I'm going to put another quote by Shakespeare of, of all the things that he has invented uh, shortly to give a sense of that, because um, it's important to understand that language is this tool of living. And so you can understand this you know, generation of metaphors is not a unusual thing, a side point, but a core point about how language develops and how thought develops. Um, so on the, in the history, in, this, in my history of idioms, when you come to the 19th century, the language explodes, the number of idioms explodes because the range of human activity grows. Uh, so there is this kind of confluence of it's, you know, there is human activity expanding dramatically and kinds of activities and the language expanding uh, in order to, uh, to control, to manage, to, to deal with it. Uh, so, okay, thank you. Okay, Please th go on. Yeah, yeah, good. Uh, thank you for that, uh, those illustrations and those examples. Um, so what I'm going to do now is uh, go back to this uh, Jamesian interpretation of how metaphors, a special type of metaphors were invented in order to come up with what we call mental words. And the, 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 this is the point that many people, especially if you're not familiar with James, have a hard time digesting because it's su such a radical claim. But basically, James claimed that there's no evidence of mental words or words to describe psychological uh, uh, experiences before uh, about uh, 1000 BCE. And what he does is he looks at the Iliad. And this is an example that um, is used a lot in discussions of Jains. And so I wanna emphasize to understand Jains, this is not the only example. There are many other examples from ancient writings that if you look at them, writings that were written before 1000 BCE, before people became conscious, you cannot find a psychological language, at least not a very robust one. And so in the Iliad, uh, Jains gives some examples of what people, what words they would use that eventually would become a psychological terminology. Uh, but at the time, because uh, the characters of the Iliad presumably were not conscious. So they had to express themselves very differently. So for example, the word uh, psyche, and of course we get the word psychology from psyche. And we still use that word psyche to mean mind, but originally uh, in ancient uh, Greek, psyche did not mean mind or psychological event. It meant blood, breath, air, some sort of life substance. Uh, another word was uh, thumos, which at the time would describe uh, motion, agitation. Uh, later on in Greece, it would mean something like the emotional soul. So we're becoming a little more psychological, but not quite there yet, at least in the Iliad. Uh, the word uh, phrenes, which meant sensations in the midriff. This would later come to mean uh, mind. Um, for example, in schizophrenia, we see that, that phrenia. That, that's where phrenia comes from. This, it's an old, very old word for heart or mind. Uh, noose, which mean, meant to see, eventually would come to mean uh, so, uh, something like conscious mind. Uh, now in English, sometimes we use the word noose to mean uh, knowledge. Uh, Crede uh, or critia comes from the Greek cardia, which meant, uh, of course, cardio, right? Cardiology. Uh, with, but originally it meant heart. And when we say heart at this time in the Iliad, it did not mean heart in the mental, emotional sense. It meant literally a person's physical heart. Um, ator, which meant heart or belly, internal sensations. So in any case, th these are just some examples. So 
um, what I'm going to do now is uh, I'll try to make this uh, brief because it's uh, it's a l little bit detailed, but um, I think it's important to, to show how Jane's really made an attempt to develop a sophisticated view of what was happening with metaphors and how they relate to uh, psychological language. And he divided metaphor into two parts. The first part he called metaphrand. And that is the thing that needs to be described, the thing that we're not familiar with, the thing that is unknown to us. And then the second part, metafire, and that does the describing. And then he actually goes one more level, uh, gets a little even more sophisticated. He talks about parafires and parafrans. And uh, I, uh, I think maybe what I'll do is I'll read uh, just a brief um, several sentences where I think uh, Jane's explains very clearly using these different words, these technical terms uh, to explain a metaphor that's very simple on the surface. And the metaphor is the snow blankets the ground. That's only five words, the snow blankets the ground. But James is able to take these five words, this very short sentence and explode it into a very sophisticated analysis of exactly how metaphors work and uh, you know, we could give many examples, but I think this is a, a good one. So consider the metaphor that the snow blankets the ground. The metaphrand is something about the completeness and even thickness with which the ground is covered by snow. The metafier is a blanket on a bed, but the pleasing nuances of this metaphor are in the parifiers of the metafier blanket. These are something about warmth, protection, and slumber until some period of awakening. These associations of blanket then automatically become the associations or paraphrans of the original metaphran, the way the snow covers the ground. And we thus have created by this metaphor the idea of the earth sleeping and protected by the snow cover until its awakening in spring. All of this is packed into the simple use of the word blanket to pertain to the way snow covers the ground. So that's just one example. And it shows you, as I said, how sophisticated language is. And we really often uh, don't notice how sophisticated language is. All these unconscious linkages and associations between metaphrans, metafires, paraphrans, parafires. This is always going on inside our minds and has been going on throughout history. Um, so in any case, uh, let me switch gears a little oh, bit. Brian, let, let's spend a little bit more time on this because I, I sure. find that this is a crucial point about understanding the power of um, metaphors, this, this point that of change that you're making. So let's spend a little bit of time on it to make sure that everybody gets it. So what we are saying is that there is something that you're familiar with. You're using that to describe something that you're not familiar with. So that direct thing, that you're familiar with is a metaphor. And the what you are trying to deal with, which is unfamiliar, it is, is metaphor. The thing that makes it really, really fascinating is that what you know, there is all kinds of connotations, all kinds of um, indirect associations associated with that, around that. And that is very real. So when you actually think of uh, snow blanketing the, uh, you know, you, you are, you're kind of, you get all of these other associations that are carried by the mind and those are carried over to the unfamiliar things. So it's not just the literal direct meaning, but it is all the associations with it that is being carried over. So what is carried over is much more richer than what would be immediately apparent to the eye. Is that, is that a yeah. fair way of describing? Like consider, for example, you're saying, uh, let's take the um, railroad thing. You're going off track, okay? So going off track, you can look at it, say, okay, you're supposed to be going here. Now you're going, you know, you're, you're off the track now, okay? But associated with it is that 
oh my god you know i'm off track i'm not going where i you know i'm you know there may be a disaster coming in in uh you know in the works and all of that is associated with going off track on the train and all of that is carried over that that sense that now where i was in the kind of explored territory i knew where i was going now suddenly i'm in completely unexplored territory i don't know where 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 things are going and so all of that from the physical meta you know physical description is being carried into the mental realm okay thanks okay all right good um so what i'm going to do now uh, is just very quickly and i'll try to give some examples but i'm going to present to you uh a four stage evolution of psychological terminology. And I think some of you have been exposed to this before when I talked about James before, but this is very important because basically what James is doing, if he's giving us a, a roadmap to show that if what he's saying is true, there should be evidence of it. And in order to collect that evidence, a good researcher needs a theoretical framework. And basically that's what he is uh, offering us here. And so he said, so, so the first stage before people had conscious interiority, how would they refer to inner events? And those inner events are often very physical. They could, you know, before we had words to describe our psychological experiences, we had to have words to describe our physical experiences. So the first phase uh, he refers to as objective terms used for mental events originally referred to simple external things and observations like psyche, which was air, or maybe something you could see blood coming out of you. So these were things outside the person. They could be auditory, visual, tactile. Uh, and uh, to, uh, I've showed this example before, but um, I think this is a really good example. Hopefully you'll be able to see it. Uh, so this word here is, um, is that backwards? I think it's backwards. Um, I thought it's, I it, it. No, it's, it's good. It's good. Is it? Okay. Yeah. Um, so that in uh, Chinese, it's chi. In Japanese, it's ki. Uh, if you've done martial arts, you're going to know what that word means. And uh, it's often used to mean air, vapor, atmospheric, uh, anything to do with atmosphere, energy. But it's translated to mean spirit feeling, mood, mind. This word goes back thousands of years in Chinese. And of course, the Japanese have pressed it into service for their own uh, uh, purposes. And so, for example, in modern Japanese now, they have the word um, uh, genki, which means vitality, spirit. For those of you who know uh, Japanese, been to Japan, it's very common to, when you meet someone, you say, oh, genki desu ka? which you basically you're asking, how is your vital spirit today? Uh, key boom, feeling, mood, that means a part of your key. Key omoi, depressed, that means your vital spirit is heavy, it's sinking. Ki nayamu, uh, that means your uh, key, your vital spirit is sick. Uh, it, it's, not, it, it's not doing well. Someone who is uh, hot tempered, we say, uh, your key is short. There's not enough key for you to control yourself, apparently. Um, someone who is brave, we say, has a strong key. Uh, someone who is insane, we say that their key is different, their key has changed. Someone who is dizzy, we say that their key is far from them. It's left them somehow. And then someone who is uh, timid or faint-hearted, we say that their, their key is weak. So they're actually, maybe, I actually wrote a paper on this. Uh, I don't know, there's maybe 150 different expressions like this, in, just in Japanese. And of course, the other key metaphor in Japanese to describe psychological events, not surprisingly, is the word uh, kokoro or heart. And there are many words in Japanese. So the hypothesis is you can pick any language. And so this is my challenge as a researcher. 
for someone to find me a language that does not use metaphors to describe psychological experiences. My hypothesis is that any language where we have records, if you trace them back, you will find um, similar uh, descriptions of, of how uh, a society has built up uh, a vocabulary of mental words. And so this idea of key, this, this is a book in Chinese, um, excuse me, it's in Japanese. And it, it's, it's an entire volume just on this one word here that talks about the thought or ideology behind the development of key. It, actually, it says uh, views of nature, the development of uh, views of nature and human nature in China. And so in, in East Asia in general, that this idea, especially Japan and China, this idea of key, this is an example of what I talked about before of a foundational metaphor. Um, and all languages have them. Here's another volume on key, Kino Kenku, just a research all on key. So uh, in any case, hopefully uh, that, that's a, uh, a, a good example. So now I wanna change gears a little bit and make a, a philosophical point about the mind. Uh, so I, I don't think there's any absolute language we can develop to understand the mind. No matter what language we use, it'll always have to rely on uh, metaphors. And I think that says, um, I think some people are frustrated with that because they want something real about the mind. But the mind by its very nature, this is where it becomes a bit philosophical, is always grasping. It's always grabbing for something outside itself. And that's what metaphors are. And so we're sort of doomed, I suppose, in this world um, to always scramble to look for uh, a language that can describe the mind. Uh, and uh, like I said, I think it's always it's always going to be uh, metaphoric. Uh, again, that that's s something perhaps we could talk a bit about later. But uh, now the the final thing I'd like to talk about is to look at metaphors from a practical point of view and to talk about the use of metaphors in psychotherapeutic or counseling sessions or settings. Metaphors, uh, from my experience working with, uh, and I'm not, I'm not the first to make this claim, of course, but from my experience, when you're working with uh, clients or patients, um, sometimes they may not have a lot of education. They may come from a household uh, that did not have a lot of books, and they may struggle when you're trying to explain to them what you think they should do in their treatment plan or what type of diagnosis the diagnosis you want to give them. Um, and what I've learned, of course, is that if you let the client speak and use metaphors and describe what they think the problem is, that can be a very, very rewarding way to deliver uh, help to somebody. Um, so patients can use metaphors uh, sort of as a window into whatever problems they have. Um, and I've noticed that with some, the, the population that I used to work with, I worked with a, for a couple of years, I worked with people, most of them uh, came from disadvantaged backgrounds. And they, as I said, they were not terribly educated. They had a hard time expressing themselves, but they were very, very creative when it came to uh, describing their problems when they use metaphors. When you allow someone to describe something using a language that is not jargonistic, that is a bit poetic, um, actually, people can do a very good job of telling you what they're struggling with. And the idea here is to encourage patients to use metaphors so that way they discover new meanings. They discover new ways, new perspectives uh, to look at their own problems, their own challenges. And this helps, of course, with uh, self-healing. And it also gives them, I think, a sense of control, a sense of self-autonomy. Self-autonomy, self-control, of course, these are terms that we talked about before 
when we talked about features of conscious interiority. So uh, for those of you uh, who remember, you can see some, uh, some overlap here with, with the Jamesian psychotherapeutics. Uh, allow, encouraging patients to use metaphors um, allows them to see, well, it, it just makes things less clinical for them. It makes things less uh, jargonistic. Uh, and I, I, I also think the use of metaphors, because as we talked about before, you have this complex interplay between metaphran, metafire, parafran, parafires. What happens is metaphors activate uh, semantic networks or, or networks of meaning in a person's mind. And it, again, it opens up more doors. It allows them to describe uh, their problems. It, uh, it, it encourages a, a, a facilitation of, um, of description, of communication. So let, just, just uh, get, let me give you a, a few examples that I just pulled out of my notes on um, uh, some things that uh, clients told me um, that, that shows you how creative they could be. So one member warned me that he could not predict when he would lose his temper in, in group, when we were doing group work. And he told me, there's no warnings on this label. In other words, that's how he was describing himself, that he never knew when he was going to uh, blow up. Uh, another uh, client describing his psychological isolation when he was incarcerated told me, while in prison, I built a wall around myself. Um, and again, you know, I mean, it, 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 when he first said that to me, it really made sense because I'm thinking you already have a wall, you're already in prison, surrounded by a wall. And yet he was trying to emphasize the fact that it was more than that being in prison for him, that there was a double wall that he felt so terribly cut off from uh, social connection. A lot of uh, patients would talk about um, being on guard against false impressions uh, with other people. So one of my favorites was that guy is gold plated, but there's rust underneath, or he's a thug in a three piece suit. One patient explained that he became suddenly energized because during the therapy session, I put batteries in his back and somehow that woke him up. And now he was interested in engaging in his treatment plan. So I'll end I'll end with um, just some more examples uh, about metaphors that I think are sort of colorful. And uh, the idea here, um, the, the, the population that I worked with um, struggled with substance abuse. And what they would do when they would talk about alcohol or drugs, many times they would personify or anthropomorphize the drug uh, in an attempt to get control over it. And I think this gave them an opportunity to better confront their hopes and fears. Um, and so one uh, client told me that for him, alcohol is like little miss alcohol, all dressed up, nice and sexy, ready to, to seduce me. Another said, crack was my God. I worshiped crack. I prayed to crack. Drinking was my buddy. It wouldn't argue or reject me. I didn't care if I put my recovery on a back burner. Drugs were my wife. Heroin was my new girlfriend. I had no social re relationships, but with drugs, well, they were the only thing in this world that loved me back. My addiction is a mean, nasty, demonic ghost waiting for me on the other side of a door. She, meaning alcohol, won't sign the divorce papers. When it comes to the urge to use, it's like muscles running from my mind, controlling my body. When I felt like using, it was like my old lover coming back and knocking on my door, asking me out for a date. So in any case, just to wrap up, you know, I gave those examples and I mentioned how metaphors play an important role in, uh, in this case, the psychotherapeutic setting in order to emphasize the importance of taking metaphors seriously and how when we examine metaphors, not only do we change our language, but indeed, I think we can change our uh, views, our view of the world. So in any case, I'll, uh, I'll end there.
Wonderful. Thank you. It's going to be Claudio, Kim, Jean, and Kevin next. Claudio. Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, yes. I, I, I found it very interesting. And I want to thank Shreitan and the Brian. Yeah, uh, you mentioned that uh, the metaphors, they're everywhere and they can have real world um, uh, implications, right? Now that, uh, what came to mind when you said that was uh, the metaphors used by, uh, if I'm allowed just briefly to speak about it, Nazi Germany, Hitler, and describing uh, the Jews. Of course, they were all false. I just some examples about um, describing, you know, the Jewish plague, uh, the stab in the back, for example, the myth, the, you know, the loss of World War One, and we know what the implications were, though, the, the Holocaust, right, genocide. Um, I just that's what it reminded me when you said that. Uh, right away, immediately, I went to the historical consequences. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Brian. If you have any comments or anything, you can just unmute and uh, start talking. Otherwise, I'll go to the next person. Brian, go ahead. Sure. Yes, uh, Claudio, I'm very happy you brought that up. Um, that, that's something I didn't mention, but uh, that's uh, that's uh, a very uh, good point, uh, how we should really pay attention to the language we use when we describe other people, especially other groups of people, um, because uh, it can lead to uh, misunderstandings and, of course, worse than that, some very ugly uh, historical developments and of course there, there are many unfortunately many many examples of that so yes we unfortunately do rely on uh, stereotypes to describe other people I mean there's a place for stereotypes I suppose but nevertheless we have to be uh, very careful uh, and make sure that any description of a group of people does not become politicized and, and then it, of course can be used against uh, that group of uh, uh, group of people. Wonderful. Next up is Kim, Jean, Kevin, and Kevin. Uh, Kim, go ahead. Hi. Um, so one of the things that came up in our group, we were talking about um, kind of the development of the language of the, like, or the concept of mind developing. And um, someone mentioned how they noticed in the Bible, I think it was the Ten Commandments, that the word mind wasn't used and then it was added by Jesus later in the second commandment. So just seeing that, like how it didn't exist at one point and it did later. Um, I've studied Buddhism and yoga. And so in my experience of, of those things, it seems like the mind is a very, like in meditation, like you're, you're observing the mind. Like, so that just got me thinking like if that, anyway, she thought it might be good you might be able to speak on that. Like if, if there's a cultural influence there, if this concept of mind existed in one culture earlier and was that's where we got it from. And okay. I wonder if you could add anything to that. Uh, okay, so uh, just let me try to address your, your question from this uh, perspective. Um, so the uh, tradition of uh, yoga and meditation as we think of it um, uh, originated in uh, South Asia, um, probably, uh, I'm not a, a South Asian expert. I don't know that much about Buddhism and Hinduism, but I'm going to uh, state that probably before the seventh, eighth century BCE, uh, if you look at the historical record from that part of the world, there really was no um, stable word or term for mind uh, that there was not a, a well-developed psychological vocabulary. That came, of course, by the 6th, 5th, 4th century BCE, not just in India, but throughout uh, the world. And to me, that's a fascinating historical datum. The fact that all of a sudden you have this explosion of uh, religious leaders, uh, religious philosophy, very sophisticated, trying to talk about something that often is translated as the mind. Um, and, you know, when we use the word mind, it, in, in the modern sense, it has a very abstract notion. And probably if you look for uh, a good translation of the word mind, like I said, you're not really going to be able to find one before 7th, 8th century BCE. Uh, in, in not just in India, but uh, around the world. Um, so uh, I'm not sure if that uh, answers your question, but um, but uh, I think it's uh, and I think it's an important question. Excellent. Uh, thank you. 
Uh, next up is Jean, Kevin, Jonathan, and Anne. Jean. Yeah, this is a fascinating topic because I use metaphor a lot myself and my husband used to laugh at me, but I always do that. But uh, I, my understanding is Jordan Peterson mentioned about order and chaos. So metaphor is kind of like use what we know in order to describe thing what we don't know as chaos. And also the important of it is it has is a package. So it's not just simple word, it's have the whole experience of that thing. So it's have the emotional, you know, components in that whole experience. That's why it's so powerful to me. For example, I'm trying to understand as an entrepreneur myself, I have this metaphor, like Amazon is like big monster. They can hunt all kinds of things. And all the people follow in the corporate, they can share a bone of meat. So they never get hungry or they get big share and they get a big monster. But as entrepreneur, we have to hunt ourselves somewhere to <laughs> get food ourselves. So we get freedom, but we could be hungry. So that's my, but you, so you can, because we, you meet a big monster, we always, you always can share a little piece, always. You never get hungry. <laughs> so that's my metaphor of entrepreneur and working for corporate. So for me, it's very helped me to understand how that works. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure it's, when I talk, uh, and also mentioned uh, thinking, you know, a metaphor also could help people to communicate. Yeah. You know, if you, you understand past experience, similar past experience, they describe something new. If you share that old experience of old emotional experience, then you can understand each other much deeper. Yeah. But sometimes it doesn't work, you know, sometimes tell them the metaphor, I'm so excited and they have no response. <laughs> so it's unfortunately. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, thank you for that. Um, I, I like that the metaphor you used actually, it's very, uh, it's very colorful and very convincing. And I think something you said uh, really sheds a, a lot of light on why metaphors are important. It comes down to c communication. And, uh, you know, I've talked about this before when, uh, when I talked about the, the Bible from a Jamesian perspective, how important uh, communication is. And that if you can't communicate, if you can't get your message across, across then of course, you're not going to uh, operate very um, effectively. And something else you said, just to reiterate this idea of how a metaphor may sound simple, but it works because of all the associations, linkages, and connections uh, that are in our non-conscious. All these things are activated. And of course, this is what James was getting at when he talked about when he broke a metaphor down into metafire, metafran, parafire, uh, parafran. That helps us explain how metaphors sort of explode in meaning and be, can, why they become so persuasive and convincing. So Gene, that was fantastic observations. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Really appreciate that. And uh, the one point about, you know, when, uh, you know, there are some cases where metaphors you can communicate very easily and second person, second times, person can look at you and, huh, what are you saying? Because it depends on whether that particular metaphor that you're using, metaphor is familiar with them or not. Uh, if it is familiar with them, for example, immediately after this, we are doing a meetup on Louis Sullivan. Louis Sullivan uses a lot of metaphors based in life, like how plants develop, how uh, you know organic life develops. Now, if a person has a feeling for that, is familiar with that, a lot can be, you know, he's, you, 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 people can understand him really, really well because you have that as a base to understand what he's saying about the psyche. But if people who do not have a base for that, it's fine, they find it difficult. So their familiarity with the metaphor um, is, is critical in uh, success of, of communication. Uh, thank you, uh, Jean. Again, uh, next up is Kevin, Jonathan, and Anne. Kevin. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Father Brian, bringing this to the metaphor topic. Um, you mentioned the air area. That's, that's, that's air. It's in the, uh, like uh, Asian life. I would say you can use the metaphor. I'll, I assume it's air area. And in English, they also have a run. This is you know, like run away. You got uh, 170 meaning based dictionary.com. Uh, and uh, I, I also I also sh share one perspective. I used to 
EDM, like the Western, you spend money like water because they're from British, uh, live, let's see, uh, Iceland, right? Close to sea. And in the Asia, like in China, we spend money like soil originally. Slowly, we get both. Like if we, we can easily use it, spend money like water, we, we know what we talk about. So the culture is exchanged. And my question is here. Uh, I sent one link about the letter A. The original A is kind of from ox hat, like original pictograph. I, my question, why is use ox as A? And the second, why is it use ox as a first letter of A? So we kind of lost lost track of those uh, <laughs> string lost the track of those uh, history and this so fundamental. We know we need uh, like uh, multiple word describe describe a specific meaning or discipline. However, we also need to find the root, try understand, and uh, um, not a deduction. Also, induction to the original meaning and our life as human being. What are your thoughts about that? The letter A is as ox. Um, well, actually, yes. So, so I'm aware of that, uh, how the, uh, the pic pictograph of ox um, became A. Uh, why that's the case, of course, I don't know. I mean, many, many reasons, many connections of course, are lost to us. We're not sure why. So unfortunately, I can't answer that. But um, I think your other question, if I understood correctly, had to do with, the, uh, is there a final root? So as we peel back linguistic layers of metaphors, um, where, where does it go? Where does it end? Is, is there something there? And um, I, 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 I don't think so, actually. I, I, I don't um, I mean, to be, I'll be honest with you, I haven't really thought it out uh, that deeply, but I suspect that because of the nature of the mind, whatever the mind is talking about, it has to metabolize and use things from the environment. And because it's always doing that, and it's always using things that are changing in that environment, um, there is no bottom to reality. At least there's no bottom to a reality that humans can comprehend. Thank you, uh, Brian. Next up is Jonathan, Anne, Laura, Govert, and Mike. Jonathan. Yeah, um, yeah, I really love this topic. It's also one of the things where, like, I personally, like, I think I've saw, seen the biggest change in thinking over my life, like, just thinking back to how I used to. It's sort of one of those things where, like, you're, uh, this is a metaphor, like, you're on a mountain, you don't really realize it, and then you realize you're on a mountain, and you can't unsee it, you know, <laughs> and so, the you know you, and and once you realize it's also one of these 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 ideas or these understandings that is so fundamental that it just is so powerful because you can start to understand where people are coming from by the language they're using and you can start to sort of start to poke at the meaning behind things whereas if you don't really have this understanding you have to you sort of are trapped in that world you're trapped in this uh a bit of of fuzziness about what people are saying because you, you you sort of just take these metaphors you don't realize when someone's using trains as a metaphor that they're talking about the same thing or it shapes the meaning of what they're saying versus when someone's using cars as a metaphor but they may be talking about the other same thing underneath um so yeah to that point you know the last point like where it sort of just goes down and down i think it's one of those things that is it you know, is a deep understanding about how people think and the way the world works. That's very useful to know. So thanks for sharing um, all these thoughts and, and I hope we see more of this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, just one brief comment on, on this present discussion. So, uh, you know, it seems like an obvious point, but I think it's uh, worthwhile uh, making that um, metaphors only work within a certain cultural context. So for example, trains, uh, using, uh, you know, he went off his rails to describe someone acting odd. That does not work, of course, in an ancient society or in a society where they never saw a train before. So there's something heavily cultural. There's something heavily particularistic about the, the use of metaphors. 
uh, the metaphors don't work. They don't communicate. They don't convey meaning unless the other person has some sense of what you're talking about. It doesn't have to be a total sense of what you're talking about, but it must be some understanding to uh, make the connection of what you're trying to say when you use a metaphor. Wonderful. Next up is going to be Anne, Laura, and Covert. Anne, go ahead. Yeah, um, I was um, trying to uh, relate this to uh, George Lakoff, who's written a lot about uh, metaphor, metaphors we live by, and the notion of embodied cognition. Um, and uh, basically, uh, as I understand the idea, the, uh, is that as humans, you know, we we're not abstract, you know, minds. We're we have bodies, we live in a material world, and uh, that's what we use to make sense of, uh, of our, uh, even of our thoughts, uh, of our social universe by, can, by using metaphors that relate to that uh, common experience uh, of being embodied in the world. Um, but then as I, well, as I understand what you're saying, you, there, there's this, this evolution from, you know, way back when we had bicameral minds, and that's where I'm, I'm trying to make sense out of this, um, and um, and I'm <laughs> I'm having trouble. So, um, it, and somebody mentioned in our group that, well, how would you kind of prove that relationship between the bicameral mind and so on when language has changed so much over time, but we don't necessarily know how people actually thought, even in time of Homer, we have something written, but what about the spoken language? Was it, you know, really, we only have a small um, uh, little sample of what uh, language people actually used, and how would you go about going back to that? to try to see if there's this evolution. And I was thinking, well, what about all the languages that actually never got a written form, but that are actually now probably pretty much the way they were then. Like I'm thinking of Native American languages, for example, the Incas and the Mayas that are still you know, used today in some communities. And could studying that uh, tell us something about if uh, there was an evolution because also the idea is that the more complex a society has become, then the more layers of metaphors you can have, right? If you have a very simple society uh, uh, at the very beginning where hunters and gatherers, you're using very, you know, basic survival, uh, animal, vegetable, uh, uh, metaphors, but until you have, um, for example, until you have agriculture, metaphors about grain and, and, you know, crops make no sense, right? You have to have reached that level for those metaphors to, to come on top of the basic ones. And then as your technology develops, then you have layers and layers of metaphors. And by the time we're talking about computers, we've pretty much forgotten about, you know, what it was like to live at a time where you were worried about the grain and the carts and the oxen. Um, yeah, so I was just kind of wondering about how all that kind of fitted in. Thank you, Anne. Uh, go ahead, Brian. Yes, yeah, so thank you. So, uh, Anne, you brought up um, some important points, I think. So, yes, uh, we're, we are always going to have uh, a partial historical record when it comes to language. There are always going to be cultures that maybe we just have some remains of temples, but no uh, rec uh, written records, or we can't decipher the written records. However, however, I think we have enough information uh, from the world's uh, list of civilizations to piece together a puzzle. Um, and as far as spoken language, you know, that's a good point. Was the spoken language different from what was uh, uh, inscribed in ancient times? And of course, in some ways it was different, but nevertheless, I think uh, the Jamesian hypothesis uh, still holds because as I said, the idea is to, um, uh, look at enough pieces of the puzzle and enough pieces do seem to fit in uh, with this view that language as we know it now with this, with a very psychologized uh, uh, vocabulary evolved from a language 
uh, earlier languages that were not, that, that lacked a, 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 a psychologized vocabulary. And the other point I would make is that actually we do have a lot of records uh, of non-literate societies. And so you would have missionaries, conquerors, uh, anthropologists following the conquerors, ethnographers going in and studying non-literate tribal societies in different parts of the world and making dictionaries of these languages. And when we look at these dictionaries, uh, these dictionaries uh, actually do not, you know, they, they seem a bit alien to us because they don't have um, a fully developed psychological vocabulary the way we do now. Now it gets a little bit complicated because many of these uh, societies have interacted with technologically advanced uh, modern societies, but still I think there's enough evidence there to support what Jane's had to say. And speaking of Mayan, in fact, when I was a grad student, uh, that was one of the big projects I did. I looked at the uh, Mayan language as it is spoken today and uh, it seemed to support this idea that um, uh, of metaphors to describe what we would call psychological terminology. So, it, so my claim is that this is a universal, whether you're talking about languages in ancient times, you're talking about present day languages, you will be able to find uh, a heavy, heavily metaphorized uh, uh, vocabulary of psychological terminology. So I guess what I'm trying to say to, the, to sum it up is I, I think the, the evidence is, is pretty robust. Um, thank you. And folks, uh, if you have missed our previous meetups on Julian Jaynes and the bicameral mind, uh, I put a link to our playlist. It is more than 10 videos uh, talking about these basic concepts. Uh, but and uh, fantastic uh, things that you put on the table. Thank you. Uh, next up is Laura Govert, Mike, and Kimberly. Laura, what's your question? Um, my question is: um, Can you possibly see the metaphor as an abstract set of words um, or sets of words that um, put together these points of words or points of words? Let me see how can. Yeah, an abstract set of words that when spoken um, yield a metaphor. Um, and I, the reason I'm relating this to if you look at an abstract painting and you say to somebody, how can you get from A to B um, looking at the points of the painting and somebody could draw one point, one point, one point and arrive at it and then take another direction and look at the points and arrive at that point and yet have another set of points that arrive at that same point. And so I'm looking at, at it from that perspective and translating it to sets of points of being words. And so I'm looking at that as an, as an, an analogy or um, maybe a metaphor in and of itself. Thank you, Laura. Okay, yeah, thank you, Laura, for that question. Um, I think I would answer uh, yes, if I, if, if I, if I understand um, the point you're making. Um, I think another way to look at it perhaps is when we use the very common metaphor computer to describe the human mind. A computer actually is very abstract. I mean, it, it's a very sophisticated piece of engineering. And so, uh, you know, if you want to express it this way, there's a lot of abstraction built into a computer. And yet we use the computer uh, as a metaphor. In fact, uh, we used, we've been talking a lot about trains and uh, uh, railroads. Um, those are very abstract uh, pieces of machinery. And uh, so, uh, yes, an uh, abstract set of concepts, an abstract set of words, no matter how abstract it is, can be condensed into something like a train or a computer. And then we rely on that new metaphor and apply it to something else. Next up is Govert. Govert, go ahead. Well, I'll, I'll continue this thing about computers. Um, our understanding of metaphors since, since uh, Julian James wrote his great work has advanced to the extent that uh, there's a laboratory in, on Berkeley uh, that's, that's <coughs> playing with metaphors, with, with computer 
generated computer understanding of metaphors. And that goes to, to something uh, Jonathan in our group was talking about, uh, about a geology of metaphors, that there are all these layers from more complex to very bottom metaphors. And it, 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 that geology is being conducted. Lakoff and Johnson and Fouconnier and Turner, there's a whole group of, of researchers doing that. And many of them, and this, this goes to what Anne was talking, very much comes back to the tacit understanding we have of having a body and moving around through the world. That many of the bare bottom, <laughs> sorry for the saying it like that, uh, metaphors are, have to do with our being embodied beings and the way we understand tacitly how we move through the world. Now, having said that, I am interested into doing some reverse engineering of what James talks about mind space with all the advances that have been made in, in uh, the science of metaphors to apply that to James um, mind space concept. Because I did, you know, I did some study, I did some writing about it, and, and I did not find anything that has, you know, robustly developed that idea. So, Brian, I don't know if you're in for it, something like that, or see the, the possibility of that, but um, I'm fascinated by it. Okay. All right. Um, so, well, of course, feel free to contact me, you know, if you'd like to uh, develop this further in, in you know, give give me a a, a sort of uh, a more detailed explanation of what your uh, what direction you want to go in. But yes, so I, that's an interesting term you used. I think reverse engineering, um, if I understand it correctly, in this context. So and, and geology, of course, uh, in our group, Jonathan brought up this metaphor of geology to uh, to uh, describe how you have layers of concepts. On top of each other, and so reverse engineering. You know, the idea is to trace the history, to trace the linguistic development of, of a set of concepts. And of course, that's that's what uh, James did. And James was not the first one to do that. Of course, there there are other people. And by the way, uh, uh, Lakoff, his name is George Lakoff. His name has come up a lot. And so um, I think his book came out around 19, in the early 80s, I think, uh, where he paid attention to embodiment, embodied cognition. And of course, if you look at James, you know, his book was, uh, came out four or five years earlier. And that's what James is talking about in his book. And he gives examples uh, mostly from uh, ancient Greek and how the first words to describe what we would call psychology are very much rooted in perception. They're very much rooted in our body in our org in, in our organs. Thank you. Uh, next up is going to be Mike, followed by Kimberly. Mike. Uh, Mike, are you there? You need to unmute yourself. Okay, let's go with Kimberly. Kimberly, go ahead. I finally unmuted. You can put okay. me after Kimberly if you want. No, go ahead, Mike. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, just uh, two minutes, okay? Two minutes. I, I have a 30 second question. Oh, wonderful, a, wonderful, wonderful. Another wonderful. 30 seconds. Excellent. Another 30 you are, you are seconds more brilliant the shorter the time you have. Go ahead, uh, sir. And another 30 second follow up after that. Perfect. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, Taking it a half step back uh, and some of the other stuff you've talked about, uh, the mind is a pattern abstraction engine, pattern recognition, pattern creation. In fact, all of biology is a pattern abstraction engine. So we see this in how babies learn languages, how babies learn to walk, uh, and how babies build towers. We see it how puppies learn, and uh, how rats learn, and even uh, how uh, the immune system learns how to deal with a new threat, uh, and uh, even how synthetic uh, uh, annealing works in how you teach computers how to learn. Uh, can you take the, your whole theory back from metaphors half a step into the general area of pattern recognition, pattern abstraction? 
Yes, 25 I, seconds. That was. Okay. Th thanks, Mike. Yes, I, I think you can. I mean, I think in a way that's what metaphors are. Metaphors are recognizing a pattern, trying to make sense of it, and then conveying meaning or a message. Uh, if the receiver cannot recognize the pattern that the sender is trying to make, of course, it, it doesn't work. So yes, I think that pattern recognition plays a, a, a vital role in how metaphors operate. All right, uh, next up is Kimberly. Kimberly, are you there? Yep, I'm Go here. Ahead. Go ahead. So how do metaphors deal with trust? Because I think it's a big aspect of trust within organizations. So when you, uh, how metaphors build with trust? Um, yeah. So between people within an organization, I mean, I guess uh, just, uh, you know, perhaps it's a bit facile, but what I'm going to say, but if a, um, if a leader of an organization does not set the right tone, does not use uh, metaphors that are welcoming or inclusive, or if he or she uses metaphors uh, to describe certain groups um, that sound exclusive or that sound insulting or uh, disrespectful in some way, of course, you're not going to build uh, any trust. Um, so uh, again, th this is an issue of how important it is for us to pay attention to the language we use and to make sure that uh, we're not re relying on outdated language. I mean, you know, that's the problem I think in our society is uh, many times people jump to a con conclusion that you are offending me or that you're being racist or sexist because of a word you used or expression you used when in fact perhaps that person is a bit older, perhaps that person is not, has not been uh, paying attention to how the language has been changing and that certain words now sound offensive. I mean, many words that I grew up with to describe other people were not all offensive. Now they are. And uh, so it behooves us, of course, to pay attention to the language uh, that we use. Thank you. Next up is going to be Peter, JJ, Jade, and Anne. Peter. Okay, I um, <clears throat> just wanted to um, mention that there's also stratification in cultures. If I uh, remember something I heard long, long ago, Apparently in Japanese high culture, there's a way of speaking where everything is described as playing at. So that you could even say, instead of saying, oh, he died, you would say, oh, he is playing at death. And that's a subtlety which needs to be encompassed in any type of a research on a language. Uh, languages will have to be built up as far as translations go. So you start with concrete and you go to more subtle, more idiomatic, which would finally include things like that. But it could also be filtered through the vision of the person taking it down. If it's a professional anthropologist doing it effectively, that's one thing. If it's someone who is a missionary whose job is to raise the savages up from their heathen ways, then there would be definitely filtration of how interpretations would be recorded. Thank you. Yes, so um, I, I, I think you're talking about the uh, significance, the importance of just doing good translations and paying attention to the uh, nuances. Um, so, you know, um, and this is a problem, I think, not just between different cultures or between different historical periods. This is a problem between groups within the same society. It's a problem between individuals. Um, you know, of course, we pay attention to the words, the language we use. And as I was saying uh, a, a moment ago, um, what I find offensive, another person may not find offensive and, and vice, uh, uh, vice versa. Next up is JJ, followed by Jade and Anne. JJ. Uh, yeah, hi, thanks uh, for the discussion. 
Um, well, I have a question and also a, a giveaway. Um, so my, well, first with the giveaway, um, I would say that um, metaphors are important. You know, they're not just ornaments, obviously. Um, I think that sometimes people who think about metaphors, contemplate metaphors are literary people, linguists, and they tend to especially the literary one, because they're, they're trying to use metaphors, right, as tools. And so they, they might think of them as something that ornaments their, what they're describing and so on. But um, I think that metaphors are important uh, because, yeah, it's how we communicate reality, interpret reality. And uh, so my giveaway is that we have to be careful with the metaphors that we use in for ourselves. So my mm, mm, the metaphor that i'm i guess in a sense um inventing right now <laughs> is uh would be called self-help metaphor and uh so when you get up in the morning uh think of what metaphors are you using to describe yourself describe your experience interpret your experience because we're always these metaphors like we might think oh i feel like i'm walking through molasses you know you might not verbalize it um you might not say it speak it but you might think like that so say no i feel like you know i am conquering the world today or i am um the happiest person or whatever you know just um so anyway the self-help metaphor that i'm going to try to apply it to to my everyday um so and then my question is i've always been intrigued by the separation of what's an analogy a symbol a metaphor they all seem to be kind of like the same in a sense coming from the same source but um, i inter i see metaphor as Something that is beyond an image, even though sometimes I, I, I read that, you know, metaphor, it can be a, a word, an image, but to me, um, it, it, it's, it's when you're carrying over meaning uh, into another system. And uh, so it's, it's more uh, descriptive than, than just one image or one word. So if you could touch on, on, on those distinctions as you see them, thanks. <clears throat> Yeah, so j just uh, yeah, very quickly. So yes, I think there is a difference between analogy and metaphor. So usually uh, when we use an analogy, we're, we're using something to talk about something else, but the, the context of meaning is the same. Um, whereas, as you seem to say, with a metaphor, we're using something to talk about something where the other domain of meaning that we're trying to describe is very different. And it doesn't make much sense uh, at first. Um, and then the, something else you said, I think it was more of a comment, but I think it's very important, this idea of uh, self-help, uh, using metaphors to, as I would put it, to check in with yourself. So for example, you get up in the morning or maybe before you go to bed at night, or maybe something is happening to you that's uncomfortable. And the idea is to describe to yourself what's happening using metaphors. And this gets into a whole nother discussion that we talked about before uh, in Jamesian terms about the relationship between the I and the me. And so how does the I communicate with the me? Well, of course the I can use metaphors to communicate uh, with the me. And why this is important, especially I think, not just for ordinary self-help for anybody, but in a psychotherapeutic setting is because when you start to use metaphors, you're telling yourself a story. In fact, you may even start to self narratize and build up a, a whole narratization of what's happening. And that's important for an individual because that has a soothing, calming effect, which is really, I think, the uh, a key aspect of uh, self-help. So the more we check in with ourselves, the more we describe to ourselves what I'm feeling. And instead of just saying, I'm worried, I'm upset, I'm angry, use metaphors because that sort of explodes out what you're actually feeling. The more detailed your explanation, the more nuance, the more subtlety you're using, what's gonna happen is you're gonna feel like you have more control over yourself 
and uh, of course, uh, over uh, whatever predicament you happen to find yourself in. Thank you. Next up is Jade, Mateus, and Anne. Uh, folks, uh, if you're not asked the questions before, I'll give you priority. Jade, go ahead. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking that language is a tool, is what, what, what I'm seeing. Um, and it's a tool for communication. Um, and I'm also, because there's a lot of talk about language and where these concepts began, and it's kind of based on the record of language. But I'm also feeling like if a group of people can function without a complex language, they likely will because it's efficient. So if, if, if a group gets something, so it's like, <clears throat> I feel like um, someone who came before me and spoke, they were referring to somebody coming in and trying to get a different set of people to do something or understand things. And I think in those instances where you're coming and cultural concepts are not a given, you have to use more language so that people get you. And you have to create a common language also, something that, that, that both parties can kind of understand. But um, so I'm kind of wondering if when things are, again, when things are communally understood, you, you less explanation is needed. And I think touching on Laura's reference to visual metaphors, <clears throat> I wanna bring us to memes because memes are still such a big thing nowadays. And memes are essentially visual metaphors. Um, me memes kind of co convey complex concepts very efficiently and very simply. It's like <clears throat> the concept of a, a picture is worth a, a thousand words or a million words or whatever the number value they decide to attach to it. Go ahead. Um, but it's, it's, it's interesting because even when someone gives you a verbal metaphor, not just a picture with a meme or a meme, because a meme is a meme, even if they don't put words on it, you still can get the concept. That's how come someone can be, become a meme because they are representative of a concept. <clears throat> but even when someone uses a, ver a verbal metaphor, you get a picture and that picture is a lot more um, efficient. That's why I think even someone else was talking about trust in an organization, but that has me thinking about how much jargon um, metaphorical jargon is within companies, um, within self-help, within all those things. Why? Because it creates a clear, they'll, they'll, if you get a self-help book, they'll have like a whole chapter on something and then you could just use one catchphrase to describe, <clears throat> to reference that whole chapter. Um, so then that also kind of gets me to think, okay, we're looking back and we're looking at, 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 at um, like records of language but again, if we think about the meme and how that is a metaphor, I feel like I don't, I don't, I'm not good with dates. I don't know anything about dates. But if we go back and we look at hieroglyphics, hieroglyphics in a sense is a is a is a visual representation of a concept of a thought. Um, I I'm going to take the risk and the leap and say that the, in in essence, that's kind of a metaphor. Like you have this image, a visual metaphor, because <clears throat> I'm going back to what was introduced before and what I've started to pull on. And so I I think it would be interesting to look back and see all the different ways that metaphors were conveyed or the way metaphorical knowledge maybe functions when, it's, where the, when there's communal understanding um, because so much less, the, there's something in there that I'm still trying to figure out, but I think there's, there's something there with the concept of how we interpret what people understand and what people can conceptualize when they don't explain what the concepts they have on their own. Because if you are able to create a metaphor, it means that you kind of on some level understand com complex concepts. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'll leave it at that because now I'm making a mess. Okay, all right. Wonderful, Jade, thank you. Uh, Brian, go ahead. Yes, yeah, thank you, Jade. So that, that's, a, well, you actually touched upon a, a lot of uh, different things. And um, so I'll just try to briefly comment on some of these. So um, yeah, this idea, when we have a community <laughs> or a group or a society of people, uh, if that group is not facing any challenge or if they don't have any aspirations, uh, well, to use a metaphor, think of a family. If everyone's getting along in a family, there's no need to delve into problems. There's no need to try and describe the problems by using complex language. And so in world history, 
there are actually societies uh, that don't seem to have changed very much. Uh, you know, we call them tribal societies. The truth of the matter is we don't know whether they changed very much, but the, the, these are low technology societies. Uh, uh, for, for example, uh, pe pe groups of people in the Amazon um, who have bumped up against modernity. And I think a lot of people, when they see these groups, they ask themselves, how come these people don't want to modernize? How come they don't want to change? Well, I think the answer is they have decided that they're happy where they are. Uh, they've decided that this is the type of life that uh, they like. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, many of these societies are put under tremendous pressure to change. And one way to measure that change is by looking at um, uh, how their, their language is changing. And you know, to get back to this idea of building trust in organizations uh, and how we have to be careful using jargon. And I, I think you're right. And uh, one of the words that uh, companies like to use, big companies, uh, whether you work in a company or you know, maybe an insurance company or something, they like to use the word family, that we're one big family. And you know, I think organizations should really be careful about the words they use because you know, we're not stupid. And when they use the word family, we know that they're in the business of making money and there's nothing wrong with that. But it sounds a little bit forced and insulting when a, a, a multi-million uh, or a multinational company is telling me that I'm part of their family. I know I'm not part of their family. Maybe they should come up with a different vocabulary in order to uh, put people at ease um, but in any case, that, that's just my uh, that's just my opinion. Thank you. Uh, next up is uh, Matthias and Anne. Matthias. Okay. Uh, firstly, uh, it seems to me that there is no perfect metaphor. Uh, said by Alfred Korzybski, the map is not the territory. So it seems to me that uh, if you're trying to explain every detail for every single thing by word we will find a lot of difficulties because every culture, uh, every person has a different point of view. Everyone will see it in a different way. Uh, my question to Brian is about uh, when a metaphor is introduced to a culture and its consequences. Um, if, uh, for example, there is a, a famous uh, example, the, code, the, the word uh, crisis in Chinese is opportunity or something like that. I'd like to know if uh, the world introduced in the new culture gives problems, gives opportunities. Could you tell me a little bit about this? So, yes, I mean, the, the first point you made, there, there is no such thing as a, a perfect a metaphor and metaphors are always changing and we're always introducing new metaphors and we're losing old metaphors and that that's that's easy to forget i think if you we look at a, a dictionary written several centuries ago i think we'd be surprised at how many words and expressions metaphoric words and expressions we don't use anymore because they simply don't make sense anymore so reality is uh, a moving uh, target and language has to adapt and language never catches up completely. I think language is always trailing behind social change. Language is always trailing behind um, reality. So um, the, the, the second thing you said about when a metaphor is introduced into a, uh, a community, I, I mean, it's related to, to what I was just discussing. If, if there's m metaphors either work or they don't work within a, however you want to define a community. And of course they have to work because both the sender and receiver, they don't have to be completely on the same page, but they should be close enough that the information being conveyed by the sender makes some sense to the receiver. Uh, because if, if it doesn't, of course, the metaphor simply won't, won't fly. Excellent. On, on this, I just wanted to uh, say that uh, this is very much applicable when new technology is introduced in different cultures. So, for example, in India, when TV came to India first, they called it Dur Darshan. That means sight, uh, Darshan is seeing, and Dur is from far. So it is like seeing from far. 
Okay, that's what they use. And I know that French also try to do that. They, they take all the English words that are coming in for the regular technology and try to create French words for it. Unfortunately, that, that's, that does not work too well because the, the metaphors have to be actually have living power. You know, just because you create something that is based on your, so Indians, you know, uh, end up just taking the word television and start using it because it describes the new thing. And uh, similarly, you know, French, they don't like the fact that English words are coming into French, but they keep coming in anyway. So I, I thought that was, that's really interesting. Um, next up is Anne. Um, okay, be before I address what I wanted to say, I just want to respond to that because um, actually, I think if you think of television, vision from afar, tele, uh, same thing could be said of English, except we've forgotten it. It's one of those sure. dead metaphors, uh, you know, telescope, television, telephone, mm -hmm. but it's just that we don't remember that anymore. Um, to get uh, back to what I wanted to say, actually, um, a lot of people uh, have addressed a lot of that uh, in the meantime, but because um, I was interested about, uh, yeah, language as communication and how metaphor is kind of a, uh, the way that uh, humans have um, come up to describe or deal with new problems, new complexities as our societies have become more complex. But if you go back to the very beginning or societies where life wasn't as complex, um, it's, it's fascinating. I was thinking of the Piraha that I've been reading about just very recently. So that's what came to mind. I don't know if everybody's familiar with them, but- Probably not, yeah. If you could um, keep it just short, we are running out of time at this point. So okay, well, just... apparently there, it's, an, it's one of those Amazonian uh, tribes where apparently their life is so easy. Uh, there's food everywhere. They don't have to worry. They don't worry about the past. They don't worry about the future. They don't worry about death. Uh, life is pretty simple, and their language apparently is the simplest in the world. Uh, and uh, they don't have terms, for example, for numbers. It's just a term for a little bit, a few things, or a lot of things. Or uh, and they don't have terms for color. Uh, they will use instead of like red, which is kind of an abstraction. Uh, they will use like blood. So is that an that's an analogy? but it's not a metaphor. Uh, so it's maybe, mm -hmm. so in fact, it's very okay. concrete, right? It's, it's using concrete embodied re physical reality to describe another physical reality. And I was wondering what you thought of that. Um, yes, uh, yeah, you're right. Actually, you know, to, to clarify, yeah, there is a technical difference between metaphor and analogy. Um, but some writers, some people use metaphor um, more broadly just to uh, describe something that's a bit familiar, not, not completely familiar, like, of course, the example you gave, uh, blood. Um, but, um, you know, to get back to the first point you made about how this particular people in the Amazon, how their language uh, is very simple. Um, so... Yeah, I think that's true. I think by our standards, it would look simple. However, just a caveat, I think probably if we look carefully at their language, there would be some complexity there, a complexity that would be alien to us. In other words, they may be describing things that are not important to us, but are very important to them. I mean, you know, there's that old experience people always bring up the Eskimos with the 35 words for snow or something like that. But there is truth to that. And that's something to keep in mind about languages. Languages, in a sense, become more complex, but at the same time, they lose things too. They lose a lot of uh, expressions. And so we always have to pay attention to the fact that languages do what a society demands. And that's dictated, of course, by the in environmental uh, surroundings. Wonderful. Brian, thank you very much. I think I thought this was a fantastic meetup. I think we did a great job of bring, you know, talking about uh, metaphors. Uh, that's a great start. I, I know that we can build on this a lot, um, but next time we're going to be talking about Japan, right? 
Yeah. Next. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. So folks, um, Brian has lived in Japan for something like 15, 16 years, something like that, many years. And uh, he has thought about Japan. Uh, so he, we're going to take you know, the ideas of Julian James and all the ideas that we're talking about of language and stuff and apply it to a new culture. So we're still trying to figure out how to make 